Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 202, featuring the fourth and final installment of my interview with the great Jeff Tunnell, the founder of Dynamics, Push, uh, push Button, uh, Spotkin, and Garage Games. This part of the interview, we talk about Tribes, the torque game engine, and its role in the uh, rise of the indie games movement. And we talk about Jeff's uh, feelings on the industry, especially the upcoming generation of consoles, why he prefers PC gaming, and just all kinds of stuff, including what it takes to get a great job in the industry, or maybe why you should look elsewhere if you're after money. Anyway, we've got a lot of great stuff to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Jeff Tonell. All right, so 1998, we're almost done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in 1998 is when we get Tribes, right? And yes, that was a good I year. I think just about everybody I know uh, it was you know around back then and gaming on the PC has played that. So uh, what, what can you tell me about Tribes? Well, Tribes was um, like after after I went left, um, after we folded JTP back into um, Dynamics and I had to go take over the whole the whole division again, then um, it was just obvious what was happening. We were seeing, you know, we, we had great 3D technology, but we were getting our butts kicked by Doom and, and uh, Quake wasn't even out yet, I don't think. But it was um, because we started, you know, you said 1998, that's when it came out, but we started working on it two and a half years before that. So... Um, so it was a Doom era when we started started and said, "Look, we got, we have to do this. This this is going to be a really important genre. We have to do it." So we kind of put together a moonshot team of the best technologists that we had in the company and and started working on it. And you know, you know, we decided our our big deal was we were going to have terrain and be able to go into buildings. We were going to just be stuck in buildings and and. Uh, and then as we were working on it, we, we came across the idea that we wanted the jetpacks and that kind of thing. And, and, and then we wanted to add in the, you know, commander view where the, the battlefield's taking place out here, but there's some guy telling people what to do and that kind of thing. And it, and it all just, it came together and it, and it worked and it worked really well. Um, I don't think that game ever sold anywhere near what it should have. Um, I don't think that we were known well enough as Dynamics was known well enough for doing those kinds of games, but if you look back, we were we were way ahead of the pack. Um, it took it took the Unreal guys a lot of years to get most of the innovations that we had put into Tribes into Unreal Tournament. So it, it was a it, it was a moonshot, and but it worked, and uh, you know, and then that ended up being the technology we used to start Garage Games. So that was a good thing. Yeah, now that we're up to Garage Games, I want to talk a little bit about the, the Torque Game Engine. You know, in Tribes too, and somehow from there, I talk about Marble Blast. Sure. <laughs> you know, I add on the show how we'll segue, but uh, so yeah, why did you decide to uh, to co-found uh, Garage Games? Well, that the um, by the time by the time we shipped Tribes, um, if you remember, uh, Sierra was sold to a company called CUC International, and then sold out to Sendent. And then they went through like the biggest economic fraud in history, and we all lost, you know, half our net worth in one day, and and that kind of thing. And it was all of a sudden Ken left, Ken Williams left the company, and it just wasn't fun anymore. So we were all looking for ways to get out, and um, and I just had the idea that you know I was working with the guys on the tribes team, and I said, hey, you know what we should do? We should build a game engine, give it away for free, and help people publish games that, that use the engine. And so that that idea that we were going to do something that radical got Mark Fronmeyer on board and then Tim Gift was our main tech one of the main technologists behind tribes and and he said, sure I'm in and Rick Overman said the same thing. So we said, let's go. And so we had enough clout at Dynamics to be able to um, and Sierra as a whole that we were able to negotiate um, a good, uh, good departure. So Sierra actually owned 15% of Garage Games when we first started, and we had a deal with them that look, we'll use, we'll repurpose the Tribes engine, the Tribes Two engine, and we'll, you'll own 15% of our company, and you will be able to, um, you know, get first look at some of these products that come out with the with the engine. Um, you now, luckily, about a year after we left. They wanted some updates to tribes, and we were able to trade updates to tribes to get back our 15% and take all the restrictions off of Torque. And 
And then also, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got, because we were going to release it for free, but Ken Williams said, why don't you just charge 100 bucks for it? And, uh, I mean, he wasn't part of the company or anything. I was just having co coffee with him one day, and he said, why don't you just charge 100 bucks for it? And, and so we started charging $100 for, for Torque. And, uh, and so it allowed us to build up a company. We started with four guys, and, and we sold enough. You know, some days we'd have zero Torque sales, and some days we'd have 10. And, I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it's $1,000 if you sell 10 Torques in one day. And, uh, but it would just allowed us to keep doing things. We, we were able to build up the company. And, I mean, little did we know, you know, we were building Unity at the time. We didn't, we didn't even know it. You know, Unity's probably worth $500 million right now. But we, um, we always did it because we wanted to make games. And so that was why we made uh, Marble Blast. And, and so we used, and it was to show off the Torque technology. And, and it was to show that, you know, you can make uh, a, a shipping game with, Torque technologies, and we ended up with lots and lots of shipping games on on Torque. And uh, but again, we were still more leaning towards wanting to make games than wanting to make the technology. So there was always this kind of schism in the company. Even when you know when we when we had thirty five guys there, maybe fifteen of them were working on the game technology, and the other twenty were working on games. And so so I think it was probably part of my fault because I, I liked working on games. But I mean, I can't say my fault. We we ended up selling garage games to. Um, to IAC, which is Barry Diller's company. They owned Expedia and Match.com and a whole bunch of this stuff. And um, and we 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 did really, really well with that. So so I'm not complaining. Well in the 2009, maybe earlier is when you founded Push Button Labs. And that was focused on the, the Facebook games and the and the iPhone games and you won an award 2010 for Social City. And so this must have been a bit of a, a change for you. So yeah, so the the way we, the reason we started so we did garage games and that was about a I think a, an eight year venture and we I mean it was great we loved it because it was we were standing up for indies you know we 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 had a we had a mission <laughs> and so by golly we were going to advocate for indies you know when we first started garage games indie software was called shareware and we started saying no no this is indies you know it would have ended up being called indies eventually but we were the first ones to go. Like, wow, no, so this you actually is coined the term indie. Well, no, you didn't, because there's indies movies and indie film production, all kinds oh, of yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, but it wasn't, being used, it wasn't being used in the games business at the time, and, and so we just started doing it. So we're going to advocate for indies, and, and we did. You know, we were holding our hands high. Yes, by golly, we're going we're gonna to do that. And, and it was awesome, and we had this incredible mission. And then once we sold to IAC, though, it just went out the door, like, immediately. That, that just went, went flat, and... And so I was only able to stay there about a year, a four-year non-compete. And um, and so I proposed, well, what if we, what if I left and you let me start make a Flash game engine? Because I, I thought Flash was becoming huge, and and it didn't have a real game engine. And so they were willing to let me do that, which was awesome. And uh, and we still, you know, again, it was an amicable departure. We had some. We were able to do some products for them and that kind of stuff, so it was a good thing. But um, they, so we, that was what made us say, let's start Push Button Labs. So Ben Garney was a, a big technology at Garage Games, and and he was working with me on this Flash stuff, and and so I said, so we got Rick Overman again, and then we also hired one of our partners was Sean, and he's he's our web guy, so he's. He was that was our the four people, and we went out and we made a flash game engine really quickly. Actually, Ben Ben pretty much made it, and at the same time, Sean was working on a bunch of web technology, and uh, and we got hooked up with um, uh, Plato, and they wanted us to help them make Social City, and so we we were the main developers and designers on Social City, and at the same time. My friend Randy Dersham was putting together a studio here for Playdom and Eugene, and they were they were hiring people. So Push Button Labs didn't create all of Social City. They, there were a bunch of people that worked in the Playdom Eugene office, and you know we were kind of responsible for the design and some of the main technologies behind it. But we put it out; it was a huge hit, a huge hit. <laughs> so so then, uh, <clears throat> as soon as that hit the market, then a bunch of people wanted to buy uh, Push Button Labs, and so we did end up. But, the the winners were was played them and then they ended up getting bought by Disney so we ended up finishing up our deal with Disney 
and um, and so so push button labs. It, we, we only lasted eighteen months or something like that, but I'm not complaining. So we, we kind of hit that whole flash game, social media, Facebook game thing just right. You know, we were lucky. We were at the right place at the right time, and so then after that, we started Spotkin. Yeah, you know, about to say that brings us up to 2012, right? With the yeah. Spotkin. So, uh, what are your you know, plans for for Spotkin? Are you going to build it up and, and I guess uh, sell it when you know, <laughs> the time is right? I'm selling any of these companies, they were all lifestyle oriented companies that I wanted to do, and I honestly didn't know any one of them were worth money when um, people came knocking on our door to buy it. So, um, you know, honestly, I thought Garage Games was maybe worth a, a couple million dollars when. But we got it was way way more than that, and uh, dynamics. When Ken decided he wanted to buy it, I didn't know I didn't know we had any value there. I, I wasn't you know even though I'm the biz guy and I should have been the guy going out. Hey, we're worth this much. I just didn't think about that. I, my head my head was always down working on technology and games, and that's the same thing here. Uh, you know our our goals for Spock and we want to make cool games, and um, I we're not here to build something up and pump and dump and sell the company. Um, you know, we're that's just not in our not in our future. So we're going to make Contraption Maker, and we hope that it sells enough that we can keep doing this, and we can keep making games like that. We got you know always have more ideas than we'll ever be able to make in our lifetime. And you know this, but this company at least is our main focus is to make games, not a game engine and that kind of thing. So so that's that's the plan for Spocken. We're just going to make games. What are your thoughts on this? The whole Kickstarter phenomenon. Um, I, I actually love Kickstarter. I, I am we. Everybody says, "Why don't you just Kickstarter Contraption Maker?" And I know I just don't want to be that old developer that goes out, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my game here." To, you know, instead we're gonna use Steam Early Access, <laughs> which is, you know, that, that's more the Minecraft model. We, we, you know, Contraption Maker is already really far along, and, and when it gets to a really good alpha, then we will allow people to, to pay less money than they would if they wait until it's done. And so we're going to use Steam Early Access. But, you know, we, we did consider Kickstarter. But I just, like I said, I just didn't want to be that guy again. And so, but I, I do think that it's a, I think it's a really powerful concept that uh, that is, I'm, I'm really glad it's out there. Well, you seem to be, you have a real knack for predicting the future, it seems, so, you know, where games are headed. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on these uh, these upcoming consoles, especially the the new Xbox, I don't know if you've been following that and all the discussion about the DRM and the always on and all these kind of uh, debates. Uh, I think Microsoft shot themselves in the foot. Um, I think that you know they can make all the arguments they want that you know cell phones are already that way and, and that kind of thing, but it doesn't matter. Um, I think that Sony has already fired the volley. That's that um, you know, I've never really liked Sony products. I liked I liked the Xbox way better than the PS3. My PS3 is a Netflix device. I think that a lot of people use it for that. Um, but I, th I really think Microsoft um, got a little greedy and wanted to be have too much power. I mean, the thing that creeps me out the most about the Xbox is the you know the Kinect sitting there telling you know phoning home and telling how many people are playing the game or watching TV. That's that's like. Maybe someday I'll be ready for that, or maybe you know my kids don't care about that. But actually, my kids do care about it. <laughs> that, I, but I'm not ready for that. I, I will not play video games before I will let that happen to me. So, you know, I'm I'm way more excited about the Steam Box. Um, I'm way I, I'm back in love with the PC again. I you know, I I'm I think mobile devices and tablets and and cell phones are both two different markets actually. But I think that. Those are incredible, but I think that that's become the new console space that you've got to be a pretty much a big boy to go play there, and and so we're going to try to build up our brand on PC, and you know then if we can build a niche there, and all the, some of those uh, app store things can get fixed, and we can go back and sell to those people. So I, I think those are I, I think the future for games is incredibly bright. I think more people than ever will be making games, uh, uh, playing games, but. Um, I don't. I think it's going to be really tough for the Activisions and the EAs of the world to play in that space in the same way they've been doing it for the last twenty years. Um, you know, they, even though there are more people playing them, there's more places to play them, and all that kind of thing. You know, the the price point has gone so low that I don't know that uh, that it, 
there will be as many people employed. <laughs> I think a lot of it, it'll, it'll be more like the music industry where most people are independent. There'll be huge hits, but most people are going to make nothing. Ah, uh, poor EA and Activision. I just, uh, it's a tear to the eye. Just be there. You know, they, they, they have their, their IPs are too big and too many people play them. They'll, they will be there, but, you know, what form will that be? It's, it's going to be interesting. We'll see. All right, so I've only got one last question here. This is something I like to ask everybody. So, you know, as somebody who's worked with so many people, hired so many people, made those kinds of uh, decisions about who, who you like to work with, uh, what do you look for in people that you hire? Or, and uh, also, how do you think a, a sort of up-and-coming uh, guy should be preparing for a good career? Well, <laughs> this is a little plug for my blog. Even though a lot of the articles on there at makeitbigingames.com are old, uh, that that advice still still holds. You know, if you if you want to be a programmer, first of all, if you want to be a programmer, you probably knew when you're eight, <laughs> and and you're probably if you're 15, you better be really good at it. You know, that, those are the guys I look for. I don't, I I don't the when I'm looking for a programmer, I want somebody that's it's just their passion. You know, and I don't I don't have to hire so many people. You know, it's not like I have a list and I need to hire a hundred programmers in this next month to make my company work. So I can I can absolutely look for the people that are just incredibly passionate about what they do. They knew what they wanted to do. Um, college, you know, I don't I don't look at what they did. It's like what did you do in your life? Did you because the, the best programmers would be college is a joke for them. They they can teach the professor how to program and you know maybe they don't get the rest of the stuff that comes along with college but you know I'm not looking for that I'm looking if I want a programmer I want the best programmer out there and and again it's when you have mankind's entire knowledge base at your fingers every single day and if you're not taking advantage of it I don't want to work with you so that's that that I think is just incredibly important um, I think that uh, you know keep your lifestyle really low end and and uh, don't spend a lot of money. That's that's incredibly important because, like I said, if this, even though there are a lot of opportunities to bring your game to market, most of them aren't going to make money. So you're going to be just like it, the being a starving programmer, starving game maker is going to be just like being a starving musician or a starving comedian or a starving writer. It's it's going to be, you know, a big deal if you make it. It's not. It's, there's no no guarantee at all that you're going to make it. And um, and so you know. Keep your lifestyle low. You don't need a lot of lifestyle <laughs> anyway. It's just you know, simple car, simple house. You know, once you get married and you have kids and stuff, this business is tough because then now you've got some pretty big overhead that you have to make, and and uh, being in the game business is not not going to be your, in your best interest. Because I mean, even if you're working for a big publicly traded company like EA or Activision, you're only going to have you only have job security until your product ships. And once your product ships, you know, if you look at it, most of the time those 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 teams get laid off, or a big portion of them get laid off while they're waiting for the next thing that they're going to work on. So, you know, that that'd be my advice. Uh, tough business, do it because you love it. I mean, actually, if you if you really love it, you can't help but do it. <laughs> so, so it's it's just like being a musician or something. So, if you're going to do that, I, I mean, it's great. It's been great for me. It's going to be great for a lot more people for a long time. Uh, I, I would definitely say, yeah, if you want to do it, get in it and do it. But, man, it is really a hard business. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with a new retrospective. And this time, the game, I'll go ahead and tell you what it's going to be. Uh, the game's going to be Frayed Knights. Uh, the role-playing game from Jay Barnson, a.k.a. the Rampant Coyote. I had him on the show a few uh, months, years ago, I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, he's got me on as a dungeon uh, maker this time. I'm supposed to be making some dungeons as the new one. Uh, so I went back and played it, so I thought I would share that experience with you. So stay tuned. As always, I want to thank you if you have donated to the show or supported me in any way, including uh, leaving comments 
comments or uh, spreading the news about episodes on Facebook or Twitter or uh, Google Plus. It all makes a big difference, guys. If you'd like to uh, make a cash donation, you can do that at armchairarcade.com. Just look for the Matt Chat link in the top right corner. Uh, set up a subscription or make a one-time payment. Either way, guys, I really, really appreciate it. I've actually been saving up to get a new PC. Mine's uh, getting a bit long in the tooth. It's uh, definitely time for a new one, so uh, that's what I'm saving up for now. Uh, pretty good ways to go on that, but uh, even a dollar in the pot would make a, a big difference, guys. So thank you very much. Now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, uh, this week, I've got a Liftbridge Hop Dish India Pale Ale. This is from the uh, Liftbridge Brewing Company right in uh, Stillwater, Minnesota. Now, I'm not exactly sure how far away that is from St. Cloud, uh, but I like to look it up and see if I can actually make a little tour there. Just, they actually talk about the tours on the bottle. It'll be pretty cool. Uh, potluck of seven hop varieties. And that's apparently the only information I'm going to get on this one. So anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this hop dish here in the rather excellent drinking horn. i got to say, I think they're uh, playing on the word hot dish, which is a popular sort of Minnesotan casserole thing that uh, everybody likes around here. Uh, it's kind of cool, I guess. And also, uh, the name Left or Liftbridge reminds me of the name Lethbridge. Uh, uh, Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart's one of my favorite Doctor Who characters, so I think we'll be toasting to, uh, to his honor this time. Anyway, let's uh, give this a smell. <sighs> Now it smells really good. That's sort of a citrusy, it's mostly citrus, a little bit of a sort of nutty-like uh, aroma there. Uh, you can definitely smell some hops in this. I think it's going to be good. So uh, here's to uh, Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. Oh, by the way, portrayed by Nicholas Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of flavor there. Oh, what am I tasting there? You can definitely taste the hops, sort of a chocolatey uh, type of uh, flavor there. A little bit of a coffee uh, flavor. Uh, it's pretty, uh, I guess I would describe that as sort of a, a dark uh, flavor. It's uh, definitely a rich, it's nice and thick and creamy. Uh, the way I like my uh, IPAs. I'm gonna say this is uh, really, really nice. It doesn't taste very strong. I don't really know what the alcohol content is here, but definitely not tasting any. Uh, so I'm gonna go maybe a uh, four out of five drinking horns on this. It's uh, definitely one of the better IPAs. I'm very pleasantly surprised uh, with this. So I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna uh, see if I can find some more of these uh, Liftbridge ales to try on the future episodes. But anyway, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And the quotation I found is from Oscar Wilde. It goes something like this. When bankers get together, they talk about art. When artists get together, they talk about money. See you guys next week. Put them in the Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden? Excellent! Execute them. Bogus. Bogus.